In Thailand, there's a textbook that divides religious ceremonies into two types, auspicious and inauspicious. And according to the book, auspicious ones are the ones where you're giving blessings for people to make them happy. And inauspicious ones have to do with death, either the funeral or the making of merit in the years after the funeral. That's a Brahmanical idea. The Brahmins had lots of taboos around funerals, and a lot of Thai people picked them up. Some people, after they go to a funeral, they'll sprinkle their heads with water before they enter the house. Or while they're at the funeral, they'll chant a little chant to themselves to sort of protect themselves from pollution. And again, this has nothing to do with the Buddha's teachings. In fact, in his list of auspicious blessings, the Buddha lists being heedful with regard to all phenomena as a blessing, as something auspicious. And funerals and reflecting on death in general are things that help us be heedful. So they're actually auspicious in this, if we make them auspicious for ourselves. Just got news this morning that an old friend from Thailand, someone who is not that much older than I am, passed away from a stroke yesterday. And of course, it, there's always one thing about deaths. If they're 10, 20, 30 years older than you are, it doesn't seem that close. But as it's getting closer and closer to your age, you begin to realize, okay, it's creeping up on you, which is a heedless way of thinking. After all, death doesn't come only to old people. Some babies die in the womb or die at birth. Little children die, teenagers die, young adults die. And as they say, death doesn't have a sign ahead of time to say, you know, so many more days until death. So we have to be prepared all the time. You probably know the story of the time when the Buddha was telling the monks that they had to be heedful think about death, not as a discouragement, but as an encouragement of the practice. And some of the monks said, yeah, I, I think about death once a day, or I think about death twice a day. And finally got down to two monks. One was saying, I think about death each time I breathe in, breathe out. May I live to breathe one more time so I can practice. And the other was saying, while I'm eating, I think may I live to have one more mouthful of food, and during that time I will practice getting rid of unskillful states of mind and developing skillful ones. And the Buddha said, it's only those last two monks who would count as heedful. So you want to be alive to the fact that death can come at any time. I mean, that's what happens to life. And it's interesting that when the Buddha is talking about being in the present moment, one, he doesn't say it's a wonderful place to be. And two, he doesn't say you just get there to hang out. He has you focus on the present moment because it might be your last moment and there's work to be done. That's what present moment contemplation is all about. In the Sutta on the Auspicious Day, he talks about not hankering after the future and not going after the past, but seeing clearly what's happening right there, right there, there in the present moment. And some people stop there and say, here's the Buddha telling us just to be in the present moment. But the passage goes on. He says, whatever duty you have to do, do it now, ardently. In other words, you focus on the present moment because that's where you do your duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths. If you're going to comprehend stress, you're going to comprehend it in the present moment. If you're going to abandon the cause, you abandon it in the present moment. You develop the path, you develop in the present moment. Ultimately, when you realize cessation of the cessation of suffering. That's going to be something happening in the present moment. That doesn't just happen on its own, by hanging out. It happens because you realize there are things that need to be done. This is why we practice mindfulness. Again, there's a misunderstanding that mindfulness is being in the present moment with a nice, spacious, kind of non-judgmental awareness. The Buddha never defines it that way. In fact, he defines it as a quality of your memory, being able to keep things in mind. 
It's your active memory, not just sitting around thinking about things in the past, but having messages from the past that you want to apply to the present moment. You combine that with alertness, in other words, seeing what you're actually doing and the results of what you're doing. Again, it's not an open, spacious awareness of everything all around you. It's focused. It's focused on your actions, focused on events as they're happening in the mind. And then you want to be ardent. In other words, you take what you've learned from the past about what should be done about these different states of mind and these different actions. So you can remember, oh, this is the kind of thing that has to be abandoned. This is the kind of thing that has to be developed. This is the kind of thing that has to be comprehended. So we're mindful, so we know what our duty is. You take those lists of feelings, say, in the Satipatthana Sutta, and there are feelings of pleasure, feelings of pain, feelings of neither pleasure nor pain. There are pleasures of the flesh and pleasures not of the flesh, pains of the flesh, pains not of the flesh. Feelings of neither pleasure nor pain, either of the flesh or not of the flesh. And if you look at it superficially, it seems like there's just a list of the possible feelings that could just come and go, and you're there aware of them. But when you look elsewhere in the suttas, you realize the Buddha says certain pleasures are to be avoided and others are to be pursued. Certain pains are to be avoided and others are to be pursued. And the same with feelings of neither pleasure nor pain. The Buddha says we don't try to impose or inflict unnecessary pain on ourselves, but if we see that by following a certain pleasure, unskillful states arise in the mind, you've got to abandon that pleasure. Some pains can lead to unskillful states in the mind, so that's the kind of pain you want to not focus on. Or if there is pain, you have to learn how to focus on it on the right, in the right way. Instead of identifying with it and seeing that you are made to suffer by it, you can ask yourself, well, how am I making myself suffer around the pain? That's a useful approach to the pain. And the same with feelings of equanimity. Even equanimity can be unskillful. So you have to be alert, and you have to remember. Remember these things, to look at these events as part of a causal process, realizing that you're doing a lot of the fabricating. Pains don't just happen. Pleasures don't just happen. There's an element of intention that goes into them. And so you have to remember that. So if you see that unskillful fascination with a particular kind of pain is coming up, okay, what's the intention that went into it? Mindfulness reminds you of what to look for. Alertness helps you look and see causal connections between the pain, say, and a state of mind. And ardency is what is heedful and reminds you that okay, if you don't abandon the unskillful things, there's going to be trouble down the line. So this is why contemplation of death is useful is a useful part of mindfulness practice. It helps keep you ardent. And ardency is the expression of discernment in these three qualities. You can be mindful of all kinds of things, alert about all kinds of things, but if you're not ardent about doing something about them, you're not really wise. You may have all kinds of knowledge stored away. But if you don't have that sense of urgency, that something's got to be done. I'm responsible for my experiences to some extent, and the extent to which I am. I want to do it well, because otherwise everything is just a loss. The pleasures you have just go, go, go. They wash away, wash away. And John Sawat used to like to ask, you know, those sensual pleasures you had last week, where are they now? You can't call them up. You can't bring them back. You can bring back a memory. But there's no guarantee that the memory of a past pleasure is going to be a pleasant memory. Sometimes it brings pain with it, especially if you have to do something unskillful around that pleasure. So how are you profiting from your experience right now? In other words, what lessons are you learning? So you can apply them. Be mindful and apply them the next time something like this comes up. That's the kind of question you should be asking yourself in the present. As for those 
pleasures and pains not of the flesh. Those refer to the pleasures and pains that come around the practice. When you're doing meditation, there's a, and you can't get the mind to settle down. That's a kind of pain. Now the Buddha doesn't say, okay, if you're having trouble settling down, then forget about it. Don't worry about it. It's all okay. Just be happy where you are. He doesn't say that. He says, use that sense of frustration to motivate yourself. Of course, you don't just stay there frustrated. You ask yourself, okay, what am I doing wrong? Go back and be mindful of the checklist. Trying to be with the breath. If the breath is not comfortable, is it a problem with the breath or is it a problem with my focus? Or is it a problem with the way I perceive the breath? The Buddha has these ways of analyzing things out so you can sort out exactly what the problem might be. And then when you can see, oh, it's because I've got this perception of the breath that it's doesn't want to come in and it's not going to come in unless I pull it. Okay, change the perception. As for pleasures not of the flesh, they don't just happen on their own. It refers to the pleasures that come from good concentration practice. Once things have settled down and they're comfortable like this, okay, how can you maintain them? What are the skills around there? There will be parts of the mind that are happy to be here and other parts that just want to wallow and forget about doing anything more. They just want to sink into it. Well, that doesn't work. There are the other ones, though, that say, okay, now that we've got concentration, let's go on to the next step. Well, you have to settle in first. As the Buddha says, you have to learn how to indulge in the, in the pleasure without losing your mindfulness. How do you do that? What's the right balance? And when there's a nice, pleasant sensation of the breath, how do you maintain it and how do you let it spread? And how can you get the mind to just be happy to stay balanced right there? These are the questions you should be asking and trying to find an answer in your practice. The same holds for equanimity, not in the flesh. So it's not that things are just arising and passing away on their own and you're just learning how to sit there and be okay with whatever. You realize they arise because of causes, and some of the causes have to do with your own intentions, have to do with what you're doing. This is how karma applies to the meditation practice. So mindfulness is there to remind you. These are the lessons you've learned from the past, either from what you've read or heard or from what you've learned in your own practice. So this is why we're in the present moment. Because there's work to be done right here. Then we think about death. That's not to get us discouraged. It actually gives us more impetus to be really meticulous about what we're doing right here, because it's going to make a big difference. And to appreciate the opportunity, not just to have a nice bittersweet experience. Oh, this is something pleasant. It's really nice. It's going to end someday, so I'll just be there with the bittersweetness. That's not the Buddha's approach. If there's a pleasure, what can you do with it? If there's a pain, what skillful things can you do with it? Because it's only in the present moment that you can apply these duties and get the results. So when you learn how to think about death in this way, this is when it becomes auspicious. It augurs well for the present moment and for your future. And again, you might hear people saying, well, we don't practice for the sake of the future. We don't want to have any goals. Everything you do has to have a goal. If you deny a goal, then you're putting yourself in denial. That doesn't help. The teachings on karma tell you, okay, what you do now is going to have an impact in the present and in the future. Remember that, too. So you can be clear about what really needs to be done right now. And that's how this becomes an auspicious day.